Yes, so um, if I remember right, we are completely finished with numerical integration and differentiation. So we are now going to enter the uh, differential equations chapter. Um, we will talk in this chapter about ordinary differential equations. Um, and that's to be distinguished with partial differential equations. Um, that's why it's here ordinary differential equations. Um, and maybe we talk about partial differential equations a little bit later when we introduce the ordinary differential equations because the ODEs, they are easier, simpler. Okay, um, <coughs> and we start with uh, first order differential equations on some interval a, b. Huh? So what we have here, this is a first order differential equation. First order means that there appears uh, uh, a first derivative of the target variable y here. So we have a, a target variable y and a, um, a dependent variable x. Huh? And we are looking for a function y of x. That's what we actually want. So we are looking for such a function y of x. That's what we want to know. What we do know is a relation between a first derivative and some function f of x and y. And what we also need for a first order differential equation is an initial condition. So we need to know one value of our target function y of x. Typically for the starting point a for the, for the, the, uh, at the left interval. But this is actually not relevant. You can take any point in the interval. Okay, yes. Um, and we, we will uh, now also look at systems of differential equations. Not only one differential equation, but a number of differential equations for a number of variables. So now we will have not only this variable y, but y1, y2, and so on. So we, we are talking about a vector, uh, a vector-valued function. Um, yeah. Uh, oh yes, sorry, on this, on this slide we call these variables eta i. Yeah? So we have for um, s such variables, eta 1 through eta s, we have one differential equation for each one of these variables. Yeah? Um, okay, and we, we are looking for these functions eta 1 through eta s with initial conditions for each one of these variables we also need an initial condition. And now we can write this in vector form. If we define this vector y as the vector consisting of all our variables uh, and then uh, we need such a vector c which is actually the uh, the vector for the initial conditions and uh, the right-hand side functions we will also put them in a vector and call it f. And then we can write this system of differential equations in this form. So now we have the derivative with respect to x of the vector y. And, I mean, you see how this is to be understood. 
it's just the vector um, consisting of all the partial derivatives. And this is the vector valued function f. And here we have the, uh, the vector valued initial condition. And it's, um, I mean, you might think, uh, why is this necessary? We could consider all these individual differential equations. But this is typically not possible. Why? Why can't you say, I first solve the first differential equation, then I solve the second, and so on? Why is this not possible? As it would be here. You just solve this differential equation, and then you may look at another one. But here it's no longer possible. Are they dependent on each other? What is they? The, 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 the difference. Differential equations. Is this a question? No. That would be my solution or suggestion. You would suggest that you want them to depend on each other? Yeah. If they depend on each other, you cannot solve them yeah. on, on their own. And they do depend. You can immediately see. How do they depend? Yeah, here on the right hand side. Um, this function phi i depends on all the variables. So they are dependent on each other and so it's impossible to solve them one after the other. So we have a simultaneous system of differential equations. And we will look at methods for solving such systems of first order differential equations. Um, now let me ask, who has seen methods for solving um, first just uh, differential equations with one variable? Nobody? So we can all go home now. Who has never heard about uh, solving differential equations? Okay, yeah. I mean, uh, there is no, no binary logic here, obviously. So there is neither true nor false. So it's somewhere in between. But we will, we will uh, do really basic uh, elementary stuff here. And we start with an example. This is a nice uh, example of a system of two coupled differential equations, the so-called Lotka-Volterra differential equations um, and they, they are a an, an very simple model of such a maybe biological predator-prey system. Huh? So there is a population of sheep uh, called Y1 of T and a population of wolves called Y2 of T. Uh, the, the dependent variable uh, the independent variable t is the time and we are, we are now looking at the time evolution of the population of sheep and wolves. And of course the assumption is these animals they live on a very simple planet. Yeah? So it's a closed system where we have only sheep and wolves and nothing else. Yeah? Um, and this is the model. Let us try to understand. Okay, and I, I hope you are aware with this notation. So y1 dot means the first derivative of this variable with respect to the time t. Yeah? So whenever you see a dot on top of a variable, that means the derivative with respect to the time. Yeah? Okay, so this means that the population of our sheep changes in time proportional to this right-hand side. 
So if this right hand side is positive, that means our sheep population increases. If it's negative, our sheep population decreases and if it's zero, then it uh, is constant. Okay, now look at it, let's look at this right hand side. When is the right hand side positive? I mean, of course we should assume that our sheep population is not going to be negative because this doesn't really make much sense. Huh? Uh, so why one of t we assume it's always positive and also why two of t also is positive. And we have a positive factor alpha here. Assume for the moment alpha equal one. So that means um, the more sheep we have the higher the increase of sheep is. Uh, I mean that's plausible. When we have 1,000 sheep then in the next year uh, there will be even more than if it would be only two sheep. Uh, because the reproduction uh, the, uh, is higher if there are more sheep. So this is plausible. A linear dependence on this number. And then we have this factor times 1 minus y2 of t. Um, and this is kind of plausible. The more wolves we have, the less sheep we have. Huh? If there are zero wolves, then this term is 1. So there is no influence. There is no such a uh, term that reduces the number of sheep. But the more wolves we have, um, the less sheep we get. So that's plausible. Now let's look at the wolves pop population. Again, we have this linear term because we may assume that they reproduce in a similar way as the sheep do. And we can control the different reproduction rates between wolves and sheep by this uh, parameter alpha. So if we assume that every season uh, one pair of sheep has 20 offspring and the wolves only three, then we can adjust this parameter alpha. Um, okay, so this also is plausible and then what we have here is y1 of t minus 1. So what does that mean? Um, yeah, if we have no sheep, then this is bad for the wolves because there is no more food for them. So then this means we have a negative right hand side and the number of wolves will continually decrease until there are no more. Huh? But I kind of miss the alpha in the second equation. We can have uh, the, the same alpha. No, well, it's, of, of course it's different. Well, it's okay, we could call it beta. Yeah? Yes, but if we would add uh, such a beta here, that wouldn't change much because we can normalize the whole system uh, in, in dividing it by beta and then we have a 1 here and, and the alpha here. So that wouldn't change. Huh? I mean it might be interesting for example here in the parentheses to add another constant and here a, a parameter. I mean we could ha at least have three or four parameters uh, and then we would be we could more sensibly adjust all the, the the parameters here. But I mean to make it simple we just have this parameter alpha. Huh? Okay, and wh so what you can see is that uh, the population of, of wolves of course depends on the amount of food they have. The population of sheep it looks like it does not depend on the amount of food and that's actually true. Huh? Uh, I mean, in the real world, of course, it depends on the amount of grass they have. Huh? But here we assume an unlimited resource of grass. Huh? So we just have these two populations. Of course, we could add a third differential equation about the amount of grass in the world. 
and then we have a third variable and so on. Yeah? And you could have a population of, I don't know, some insects that disturb the sheep or some disease, a bacteria, whatever. And then finally you have a differential equation with one billion of variables like it's on this planet. But we couldn't solve it anymore. For example, in the equation one, we substitute the value for sheep as thousand and bulls as two, it will be negative. In Excuse the, me? In the equation one, if yes. we substitute the value of sheep as thousand and the bulls as two, it will be negative, right? If the sheep is one thousand, then you have one thousand here and the wolves is two. One minus two is one. And and then it will be negative. Yeah. Only the fraction if Yes, the, yes. Um, it will be negative if? No, uh, for example, if we consider second equation 1000 sheets, then, then also the value will be too high. 2 into 9999. Yes, 1000 times. Um, 2, the, 2 into 1000 minus 1. 2 times 1000 minus 1, yes. So what was your assumption? 1,000 sheep and two wolves. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, and that would mean the wolves would strongly increase. A very large right-hand side, and that's of course true. They have kind of infinitely much food. So they would increase, the, the wolves population would increase very fast, and the sheep population would decrease. Yeah, I mean, I already told you, you could, you can enter here a parameter if you don't like this. Huh? You could scale it. I mean, this is just for, for illustrating such a predator-prey system. Huh? And it works, as you will see. We will solve this system. Huh? Um, and I mean, it's, it's such a nice example because it's so easy to understand and you see that you have, uh, you, you get a dynamics of your populations. And the two populations, they depend on each other. And actually what's also important here is that this already is a nonlinear system of differential equations. Why is it nonlinear? On the first glance, it might look linear, but it's not. I mean, if it would be linear, we could model the right-hand side as a matrix times vector. So if the system would be linear, then the right hand side would be something like a matrix A times the vector Y. But this is not possible here. How can you model a product Y2 times Y1 in this way? This is impossible. Huh? So a right hand side might be so y1 dot of t is equal to 3 times y1 plus 2 times y2. That would be a linear right hand side. But as soon as we have a product of two variables, it's nonlinear. Okay, we can write this system in vector notation, which is quite simple. Um, and now let's look about uh, look at how we can solve such nonlinear differential equations. Um, what you I hope had in previous lectures was about how to solve linear differential equations. Who remembers this? 
who had this? Let me ask this. <laughs> okay, some of you had this. But you forgot it already. We will look into linear systems also, in, in the simplest form of linear systems. That's what we will look into. But first, I mean, now I do kind of the inverse approach. We first look into the nonlinear system because this is what happens in practical real applications. The linear systems, they are kind of trivial um, and you can't find the solutions in textbooks. Huh? But the nonlinear systems, that's what happens in practice and you have to solve them. And there is actually an easy numeric way for solving them in, uh, in the well-behaved cases. Huh? Um, okay, and now we look at how to solve such a system and then we will look at the solution of this system. Okay, yes, okay. But yeah, before we go into our algorithms, um, I want to show you that it is possible to transform any system of ordinary differential equations into a system of first order differential equations. That's why first order differential equations are so important. Huh? And let's look at this example. We have a third order differential equation. And yeah, let's look at this example. Here we have the third derivative of y with respect to x. And on the right hand side we have some function g. And this function g depends on x and y of course and it also depends on the first derivative and the second derivative. Of course in such a third order differential equation there may occur third, second and first derivatives. And that's what we have put into the right hand side into this function g here. And, and also for a differential equation of order n uh, we need n initial conditions um, for all the derivatives. So for the zeroth derivative, for the first and for the second, for example. Yeah? Um, yes, so we need three initial conditions if we have a, a third order differential equations. And now there is this nice and easy substitution trick. What we do is we substitute. Uh, we substitute our original variable y by some new variable. Th this is actually not, uh, not necessary. You see the new variable is the same as the old. But here it gets interesting. Now the first for the first derivative we invent a new name, a new variable, eta2. And for the second derivative, we also invent a new name. We call it eta3. And now if we do this, let's look at this third equation. This whole system becomes very simple. It's now a first order differential equation because we, we have the derivative of eta3 with respect to x. Yeah? Because eta3 already is the second derivative and one more uh, uh, derivation gives the third derivative and on the right hand side this g depends on eta1, eta2 and eta3. And you see it's now a first order differential equation. That's it. It's so easy. But of course we should not forget what we did here. We need to add this differential equation and this differential equation. These are two additional differential equations which we write here. And now we have a system of three coupled differential equations. And they are coupled as you can see easily. Here the derivative of eta1 depends on eta2 and uh, the one for eta2 depends on eta3 and the one for eta3 depends on all of them. 
So you can always transform a system of ordinary differential equations of order n to a system of first order which is equivalent. Oh yes, and look at the initial conditions. I mean these initial conditions are easily being transformed into these. And that's why in the following we will look at first order uh, systems of first order differential equations. Um, yeah, let me make one remark. This transformation works for initial value problems. Uh, initial value problems are such problems where you have some initial values, for example, at one time uh, t equals zero. There are also so-called boundary value problems where you don't have the derivatives, all the derivatives at the left border, but you may have one value at the beginning and one value at the end, and they are different. But we will look at them too at second order boundary value problems. But first now we talk about uh, first order systems of initial value problems. Okay, yeah. And here we have the theorem related to this example. Any system of ODEs can be transformed into an equivalent system of ODEs with derivatives of order one only. Okay, and now we look at the easiest method for numerically solving such nonlinear systems of ODEs. Um, so what we first do, let's look at this picture. Huh? Here we have the variable x and here we have y. And we are looking for a function y of x which solves our differential equation. Here we have the differential equation. The differential equation is this. It's this. So the first derivative on the left hand side and our function f of x and y on the right hand side. Okay, and we are looking for some target function y of x which is unknown. Now what we first do is we discretize this axis. We have such a starting point A and then um, we put a one-dimensional grid on the x-axis with a step size of h. And now on this grid we discretize our first derivative and you already know how to do this. Yeah? So we approximate this first derivative um, by yn plus 1 minus yn divided by h. This is exactly our approximation uh, for the first derivative. So if we want to know the first derivative in this point then we take yn plus 1, which is this one, minus yn divided by the step size h. And we can do the same thing at all these points. Okay, so, so far this is only an approximation for the first derivative. And now we set this approximation equal to the right hand side of our differential equation. And now if you look at this, we can solve this equation for yn plus 1 assuming we know yn. And then we get this equation. yn plus 1 is equal to yn plus h times, we multiply the h to the right h times f. And you see 
In order to compute yn plus 1, you need yn. You need to know yn. But this is actually no problem because we are talking about initial value problems. So you need to know some initial value. You need to know this value y0. When you know this y0, then of course you can solve for y1 and you will get this. And then you can solve for y2, y3 and so on. And if you look at this picture, you see that this y1 is not on this line, which it should be actually. Because I, of course I want to know these y values um, of our target function y. So we have a little error and this little error is due to what? To the step size, yes. So for step size equal to or uh, for in the limit for step size towards zero, um, the error would decrease. But why do we have such an error depending on the step size? Because we made an approximation for the differentiation. Yeah. Because we used the tangent in this point and we, we make an, approx an, an uh, extrapolation, um, a linear extrapolation with the tangent here. And that's why we get an approximation error. And what you also can see, and here again, we use the tangent of our function, which is actually the tangent up here, but we, we, we uh, take it down here. So we get an, another error. And you see, these errors, they will all sum up. They will sum up. Huh? So it's, I mean, either you use a very, very small step size h, or you use a better algorithm. This is really a problem. And I mean, look at our sheep wolves uh, example. You want to may um, uh, you may want to have an extrapolation of your population into the far future, but as you can see, this method would only be good for the near future, for maybe two weeks, but not for two years. Okay, yes. This is the so-called Euler method. Um, here we have an example. Of course it's good to test such a method with an example where you already know the solution because then you can compare your results with the solution. And I took this differential equation. Y prime is equal to Y. What is the solution of this differential equation? It's the exponential function. I mean, we could call this differential equation the, the determining equation for the exponential function. Because for the exponential, um, the derivative is identical to the function. And th that's what this uh, equation tells us. OK, so here this red curve is the exponential. That's the true solution. For the initial value, uh, y of 0 is equal to 1. And now I use the Euler method, I applied the Euler method with a step size of 0.1 and 0.2. And here you see the points. You see a tiny difference here, but you see how it increases. And if we look at this point, you see that with h equal 0.1 we have this error, with h equal 0.2 the error is about twice as large. And we will actually see that the 
error of this method increases linearly with age. And this is of course not nice. Yeah? We want to have uh, what, yeah, what would we like to have? What type of dependence on our step size would be better than a linear dependence? Tell me, what would you like? Depending on 1 over h. Oh, that would be actually as bad as it can be. Because for h towards 0, your error would go to infinity. That's what you don't like at all. I mean, oh yes, maybe that would be actually good because you could use a huge age and you would have a zero error. Yeah? But that's what uh, does not exist. Yeah? You want to have an error that increases fast with age. Yeah? like the h squared or h to the fourth power, for example, that would be nice. I mean, we should talk about how does the error decrease with decreasing h. So if h goes to zero, how fast does our error go to zero? That's what we have to ask. Huh? And then, of course, a quadratic decrease of the error is much better than a linear decrease. You should always have this picture in mind. If we have h here and the error depending on h, that would be a linear decrease, but quadratic is like that. It's much better. Huh? And fourth power is even better. And we will find with the runge kutta method a method that has um, a fourth order error decrease. Okay, here you can see the, the numeric values. So we have our xn, our yn, these are exactly the value from the figure before. And here again you see the error with h equal 0.1 is 0 0.05, with h equal 0.2 is 0 0.094. So it's almost twice as large. Okay, and now we, we, we calculate the error dependence, which is very easy here. Yeah? If we look at a Taylor expansion of our function y, of our desired solution function y, then we can write y of xn plus 1. Yeah? Um, so we, we expand our function in the point xn. Huh? Then y of xn plus 1 is y of xn plus the first derivative at xn times h plus the second derivative divided by 2 factorial times h squared plus the third derivative times the third power and so on. That's just a basic ordinary Taylor expansion. If you're having a problem with this, you should really look at it at home. I mean, that should be uh, really uh, one of the simplest tasks to expand such a, uh, to do such a Taylor expansion in the point xn. Uh, please look at this at home again. Okay, now when we have this Taylor expansion, What's very nice here is on the left hand side we have y of xn plus 1 and on the right hand side y of xn. We bring this to the left hand side and divide the whole equation by h. And then on the left hand side we have our approximation term. Look, this is exactly what we 
hand here. This is exactly the left hand side of our Euler formula. Um, yes. Um, and now we uh, look, when we take this to the left and divide the whole equation by h, then what remains here is y prime of xn. And now we put this on the left hand side and that's what we get. Huh? Now what, what's on the left hand side? This is the approximation for the first derivative at the point xn. And this is the first derivative at the point xn. So what, what you see the left hand side is the approximation error. So now we have a formula for the approximation error. And that's it. And you see the leading term in the Taylor expansion is the term linear in H. And then comes the, the squared and the third power and so on. I mean this is quite similar to what we did in numerical integration and differentiation. Um, and we can, for example, apply Richard's next operation. We find a solution with the Euler method um, for our differential equation and then uh, we uh, do it again with uh, uh, the, the doubled step size 2h and then we can apply Richard's next operation. Okay, but the really important fact is we have now proven that the approximation error uh, decreases linearly with h. Uh, so that's what we have seen here, which is actually true. Okay, yes. So now we, we are ready to apply the Euler method. Um, but we, we want to have better methods. Yeah? Um, and now we look at the so-called Runge-Kutta methods and the simplest Runge-Kutta method is the so-called Hoyne method. And here we have a new and interesting idea. So what we do on the left hand side is the same thing as before. We take our approximation for the first derivative. Yeah? Maybe we go back to the Euler method again, Euler formula here. So the left hand side, here we use an approximation. And because this is only an approximation, it's not exactly equal to the right hand side. That's why we get an error. And now the idea of these Runge-Kutta methods is um, to kind of produce the same error on the right hand side. Yeah? To modify the right hand side such that it's, it, uh, it gets closer to this approximation on the left hand side. And this is um, I mean, all these Runge-Kutta methods, they are kind of heuristic. Yeah? So people try to use this formula and that formula and then with the new formula they uh, do the Taylor expansion and prove how this error dependence on H goes. And that's what we see here with the Hoyne method. Look, the left hand side is the same as with the Euler method, but on the right hand side um, we have f of xn comma yn. That's what we had before. But look, we have kind of an averaging. We have f of xn and yn plus f of xn plus 1 comma and yeah, we, we, we could try to write here yn plus 1. That would be the first simple idea. Y 
we would like to write the following. We would like to do an averaging on the right hand side. So the right hand side should be one half times f of xn comma yn plus f of xn plus 1 comma yn plus 1. That's actually what we would like to write on the right hand side. And now as you can see uh, you do an averaging. You take the average of the function at this point and at the next point. Uh, look, why is this a good idea? Look at this picture here. The error of the Euler method comes from taking the first derivative at this point. If we would take the first derivative at this next point, it would be too, too steep. So here it's too flat. If we would take this one, it would be too steep. Uh, so maybe we should take an average on the right hand side between these two points. Uh, And that's what we have here. But this is impossible. We can't get this. Why? I mean this function, we have this function f and it's defined on the whole interval. So it's actually no problem to compute f at this point. But what is the problem here? The problem is this, yn plus 1. We don't know this value. Why don't we know it? Because we start from the left. We start here. We know y0. And now we are going to calculate y1. But we cannot use uh, y1 in order to calculate y1. That's why we don't know this guy here. Huh? And that's why we use an approximation for yn plus 1. Now maybe you can understand what we do here. f of xn plus 1 comma yn plus h times f of xn comma yn. What is this? This is a linear extrapolation of our function f from the point, from the, the nth data point to the n plus first data point. Yeah. Okay. So this is what we now try. And now we solve this equation for y n plus 1. So then we multiply the whole right hand side by h. Um, and we get a plus yn at the end. And that's the formula. yn plus 1 is yn plus 1 half times k1 plus k2 and k1 is h times f of xn comma yn and k2 is h times f of xn plus h. Yeah, this is, this is xn plus h, xn plus 1 comma yn plus k1. Yeah, and k1 is h times f of x n comma yn. Yeah. So that's the new formula we get. And now of course the interesting question is how does our error decrease with h? And we don't, we don't go into the Taylor expansion and the proof. I just give you the result. And as you can see, this is very nice. Now we have a quadratic decrease of the error with h. 
And again, we can do Richardson extrapolation with these exponents, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So this Hoyn method gives you a much better uh, solution. Okay, and now we look at the uh, very popular fourth order Runge Kutta method. And here we have a similar scheme. Again, we do um, a modification of our function f. And uh, this is the formula. yn plus 1 is yn plus 1 over 6 times this. You see, what we do here is an averaging. Yeah? An averaging of um, four terms, but two of them are weighted with a factor 2. So we actually have kind of six terms. That's why we divide by six. Yeah? Um, and these four terms are h times f of x n comma y n, which is nothing new. Yeah? This is k1. And then we take this second term with a double weight, which is h times x f of x n plus uh, h half and y n plus one half k1. You see this k1 again is the linear approximation of our function f at the next point. Yeah? Okay, and what is this here? Um, I, yeah, yeah, okay. So it's, it's actually the same as here, but um, for, for yn, we use the, the k2 approximation. And here we use the k3 approximation, and please don't ask me how these weighting coefficients are determined. Huh? I guess nobody knows. But what What's important is this. We have to tune these coefficients such that we get such a nice result. So now we have a fourth order approximation. You see the leading error term is h to the fourth power, which is very nice. And that's the method everybody uses. Um, actually, this is not the end of the optimizations uh, for solving first order differential equations. If you look in the advanced numerics books, then you will find uh, even better algorithms. We don't look into these here. Um, but, yes. So, a, a next idea to Im, to, in order to improve the whole thing is, so we have our x here and um, our differential equation is y prime is equal to f of x and y. That's the differential equation. So, of course, it all depends on this function f. It all depends on the behavior of this function f. If this function f, for example, is linear, then everything is getting trivial. Huh? Because then already the Euler method gives you an exact solution. So it's interesting if this f is nonlinear. And as you can imagine, the more nonlinear f is, the worse our results will be. And what does it mean for f to be more nonlinear? Can you imagine an ugly function? 
We, we all agree, I think, that linear functions are not ugly. Huh? So we have to be far from linear. What is far from linear? Random. Random. <laughs> Um, so what do you mean? Your function is just like random, random points. Um, yes, but of course we have to assume here, because we are talking about real numbers, that the function is defined for all x. Huh? Yeah. So I approximate a function to this random function. <laughs> uh, you have some random points. Okay. And then you approximate something to it, like that, yeah? Okay, yeah. Yes, I mean, that's a good idea, and the closer your random points are to each other, like, then it becomes really erratic, yeah? And that's, uh, that's what I also would call ugly, yeah? And, uh, I mean, here the function depends on two variables. So we have, uh, I can't draw this here, so we would have another axis and then it would be a surface which is ugly behaved like that. Yeah? Okay, what should we do if, let's say, the frequency of this noise is very high? What can we do then? to get an, a good approximation for our uh, differential equation solution. Of course we use the fourth order Runge Kutta. What else can we do? Increase H? Increase or decrease? Decrease, decrease H, yes. yes. Use as small an H as possible. Um, yeah, I mean, that's actually what you will do in the exercises. If you solve the exercises on the computer, I mean, the first one or two exercises are very well behaved, no problem. But there is one exercise where you will see that even with a small age, if uh, the, the time of evolution goes over time, you would get chaotic results which have nothing to do with the correct result. No? Um, and the reason is that this function f is not so nice and uh, not close enough to linear. And these improved methods, they now do the following. So let's assume um, our function f looks like that. If this is our function, then we should especially be careful in this area, where we have a lot of noise or nonlinearity, however you would call it. And these are the methods um, with adaptive step size. So these methods, they would in such an area decrease the step size and in this area use a larger step size. No problem here, but here we, use, we should use a smaller step size. Huh? So the step size h is adaptive and on what would it depend? How would you decide uh, whether you decrease age or not. Frequency. Yeah, but how do you determine the frequency? <laughs> there is nobody who you can ask. On the change of the first derivative. Yes. So that's a basic idea. You look at the first derivative of your function f. I mean, f depends on two or even more variables, so you should look at the partial derivatives. df with respect to x and on the partial derivative uh, with respect to y. 
of x and y. And if we have more variables, then there are more partial derivatives. And now, okay, <laughs> but the problem is we don't have these partial derivatives. Now, if we don't have them, what to do? We approximate them. We use our um, approximation method for derivatives. Yeah? And this works for partial derivatives in the same way. Okay, and of course then we, we have to go into the details and look uh, again at the Taylor expansions and the errors and so on. That's what you find in the advanced numeric books. We, we, we skip this here. Um, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, and here in this tabular we have a comparison of these three methods that we have seen. Euler, Hoyne and runge -Kutta. And this comparison is again on this trivial uh, differential equation where we know the correct solution. And in this first column, so we have our xn, we have the correct solution which is the exponential function and here we have the Euler solution, the Hoyne and the runge -Kutta. And we, we just have to look at, uh, at these values. So this is the correct value. Here we have 1.77, 1.82043. And here you see uh, it looks like it's the same. And if we look at the error, then it's 8 times 10 to the power minus 7. So le let's look at this is about 10 power minus 1. This is 10 power minus 3 and this is 10 power minus 7. Uh, so the number of digits, uh, the number of correct digits doubles from here to here and again it doubles from, uh, to here. And that's why, uh, that's because here we, uh, the error decreases linearly with the second order and with fourth order here. Okay, oh yes, and maybe I should uh, make a reference to this book of Schwartz. Uh, I mean, that's actually the copy we have in the library from 1988. Of course, there are uh, newer editions of the book, but this is a very good book on numerical mathematics from Schwartz, and we do have a couple of copies of this book in the library. And there you can read about these adaptive uh, step size control methods. Okay, yeah, let's get back to our example, this um, predator prey system. Um, and I, I implemented these methods and applied them to this uh, system. And here you have a time evolution of wolves and sheep with some parameter alpha and some initial condition. Um, yeah, so here we have the time axis and here we have the population of wolves and sheep. So red is the sheep and blue is the wolf. And here you can see the initial condition. So we start with one wolf and three sheep. I mean, what you can see here is, uh, of course, we have an approximation, so it's possible to have 2.4 sheep. Huh? Um, start with this initial condition. One sheep, uh, no, sorry, one wolf, three sheep uh, in, uh, in the beginning, and we have this parameter alpha equal 10. What does alpha equal 10 mean? Alpha equal 10 means that our uh, sheep uh, do reproduce uh, quite good. Okay. And now because in the beginning we have much more uh, sheep than wolves, the wolves have enough to eat. And they will eat. Until we have uh, increased our wolves population by 50%, 
and then they start decreasing. Why, start, why do they start decreasing? Because they have eaten all their food. You see, the sheep, they decrease rapidly and at this point there is less than one sheep. So our wolves don't have enough to eat and that's why they decrease until we have such a minimum here. And now because we have only 0.7 wolves, huh? the sheep start increasing and so on. And you see such a nice periodic behavior. Huh? And of course, I mean, that's really fun to play around with such a system. There are, there are of course, interesting questions. How should we set our alpha such that all the wolves will die after this first maximum and so on. Yeah, th these are really nice uh, questions and games and when you play around with this long enough then you may for example see some limitations of the model and then you would say oh why don't we use a third population which is the population of grass and then it's even more interesting and maybe at some point the sheep have eaten all the grass and then they will all die and then the wolves will all die and whatever. Yeah? Yes, I, uh, that's really nice. So that's what you can do with differential equations. Really nice playing around. And uh, I mean such differential equations and such population models are used not only in biology, they are very important also in um, economics. For example, um, maybe you, you remember there was this book um, Grenzen des Wachstums, what's that in English? The Limits of Growth, maybe that was the title. Uh, written in the 1970s by the Club of Rome and in this book they used such dynamic models of the evolution um, or, or the, of the, uh, the en environmental problems depending on the oil resources, depending on the population on the planet they used some dynamic models and of course they, want, they wanted to uh, have uh, a prognosis, an extrapolation into the future, uh, for example of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and so on. And they used such models and made extrapolations which were not too bad. There is actually a new, a new version of this book, it's called 2052, which comes out these days, maybe next week, maybe in two weeks. Why is it called 2052? Yes, because 2052 is in 40 years. And this first book was written 40 years ago. So 2012 minus 40 was two th uh, 1972. Yeah, in 1972 they wrote this first book. Now it's 40 years later and now they write a book about the next 40 years which will come out in one or two weeks and maybe they again use such dynamic models uh, to extrapolate to the year 2052. Um, and of course, I mean, and that's your task as an engineer. The really critical point is, what is the really critical point here? The really critical point is not the numerics. To set up these equations. Yes, the modeling. Is this a good model for the sheep wolf population? Or is there some error, something which we oversaw, whatever? That's a really critical point. And that's your task as an engineer. 
I mean, you can rely on mathematics. There is this Taylor expansion. There are good algorithms and so on. You may get numeric problems anyway. Yeah? But even if there are no numeric problems at all, the modeling is your part and nobody will help you with this. Yeah? Um, and that's why you, of course, need to have a very good knowledge of your application area, why you need a lot of experience and so on. But that's a really non-trivial uh, task, the modeling. Okay, yeah, I mean we looked a little bit into the modeling of the wolf sheep's population and we already talked about adding extra parameters in here and uh, adding uh, other populations and uh, of course you can, I mean you can locally test whether these, this model is good or not. Yeah? Uh, you can, uh, I mean, what you, have, what you would have to do if it's really about sheep and wolves, you would have to look at such a population of sheep and wolf and test whether, whether this holds or not. Okay, yes. Okay, yeah. Now let's talk about uh, second order differential equations with boundary values. We are, we are no longer talking about initial value problems, we now talk about boundary value problems. And the boundary value problem is, again, a second order differential equation, but with two boundary conditions. y of a is equal to some value alpha, y of b is equal to beta. What is different now? What is the difference to an initial value problem? It's just a very tiny difference here in this, in this line here. Where is the difference in this line? How should it be if it were an initial value problem? Let me modify it. The initial value problem would be y prime of a is equal to something. That's an initial value problem because we have an initial value for y and an initial value for y prime uh, on the left uh, border of our interval. But now we have uh, no first derivative, we just have an initial, uh, sorry, a boundary value at the left uh, border and at the right border of the interval. And that makes the whole thing different. Why does it, why is, uh, makes it a difference? Look. We have such an interval AB. On this interval, a, b, we want to know our function y. Now with, with such an initial value problem, we start with such an initial value for our function y. Um, and if it's a second order initial value problem, we even have an, a value for y prime here. So then we, we even know um, the first derivative, which is maybe like that. And then we start from here, step by step, and extend the range of our function y. This is no longer possible if we, we only have this value here, but we also have this value here. Yeah, and so now one idea would be to start from here and maybe to start from here and then here in the middle maybe we might get a problem here in the middle. Yeah? Because the error here in the middle would be of course bigger than it's here and then it's here. Yeah? Um, yes, but 
this does not work. This does actually not work with our Runge Kutta methods. Because they need, uh, if I have an nth order system, n initial conditions here, and they would need n initial conditions here. But we only have one here and one here. So uh, we use different methods. Um, the first thing we do is, look, here in our second order system we have a second and a first derivative. So the first thing is we approximate our first derivative and approximate our second derivative. These are the, the well-known formulas for the first and second derivative. Um, yeah. And again, what we also do is we discretize our interval yeah, into m sub-intervals of width h. h. And we have that now our um, points in the interval xi is equal to a plus i times h. Okay, and now we do the approximation of our function y of xi. So, suppose we have for each point in our interval one line. This is the first point y0 is equal to alpha, this is the last point, ym is equal to beta. These two points. They are simple. And on all the intermediate points, we just do an approximation of our differential equation. Look, the left hand side is the second derivative, which we have here. Yeah? That's what we have here on the left hand side, but as you see, we multiply the whole equation with h squared. That's why we have the h squared here. Times f of xn, comma, yn, comma. And now here, we just replace our approximation for the first derivative. That's a straightforward mechanism. Yeah. Um, and this, of course, this equation um, has to hold for all inner points of the interval. So this, we have uh, this equation for n equal 1, 2, 3, up to m minus 1. Huh? For n equals 0, we have the boundary condition, and for n equal m also. But for all the inner points, we write down this equation. And now if we look at the left-hand side of this equation, you see that um, in all the inner equations, we have these three values, yn plus, plus 1, yn, and yn minus 1. Um, and this is something we know already. Um, we know such a left-hand side from spline interpolation. When we, when we did spline interpolation, we ended up, uh, that was last semester, we ended up with uh, uh, a square matrix uh, with a lot of zeros, but the main diagonal and the two um, neighbor diagonals, they were non-zero. And that's what we have here. This is the diagonal element in the matrix this is the left uh, neighbor diagonal and that the right neighbor diagonal. So we get such a, uh, a tri-diagonal system which with, where the matrix is this. The coefficient matrix, we have 1, minus 2, 1. Why? Because of this. 1, minus 2, 1. Okay, yeah. Um, now we write our boundary value problem in vector notation. I mean, uh, now be careful here. Um, we are talking not about a system of linear, uh, of uh, differential equation. 
we have a one-dimensional differential equation and this remains the same. No? It's only one-dimensional. There is a one-dimensional variable x and y also is one-dimensional. But we are, I mean, we are talking about this whole interval. We are now going to solve the system simultaneously on all the points in our interval. So these points in the interval, they now produce a vector. So the size of this matrix, um, it is an m by m system and m is the number of our points in the interval. Okay, so and now this, this vector f is f1 through fm minus 1 where these, uh, these values they are nothing but the function f applied to our points here in the interval. So this is the vector. This is the vector of all function values in our interval. And now we can write our linear system in matrix form. So we have this matrix A times Y, which we have already seen. And on the right hand side we have H squared times the vector F applied to our vector y. And this is the vector y. This is the vector f minus r. And now this r is, yeah, this r has an alpha here and a beta here. Because these are our two boundary conditions. Yeah. And the linear system we get is quite similar to what we had when we did spline interpolation. Um, yes. And what do we, do we remember from our spline interpolation algorithm? Um, how can we solve such a, a tridiagonal system? We can use the Gaussian elimination because it's a linear system with a square matrix. But we can do better. What is the complexity of the Gaussian algorithm? How does the computation time depend on the size of the matrix? Hmm? Cubic. Cubic, yes. So the computation time is proportional to this m cube of Gaussian algorithm. But what did we do with the splines? We did it linearly. Why can we do the elimination in linear time here? I mean that's what really disappoints me. You forget it all after the examination. Why can we do it linearly? Because what does the Gaussian elimination? It eliminates this lower triangle of the matrix. But there is not much to eliminate. There is only this one vector to be eliminated. And that can be done in linear time. Yeah. And then the backward substitution um, also. So that's good news because otherwise our effort would increase with the third power of the number of points we use. That would be really bad. But with this, with the tridiagonal algorithm, we can do it in linear time. Okay, so that's good news. 
the, the computational complexity is not too bad. And now about the approximation error. Here we have the result uh, for the approximation error. And this is not too bad either because the leading term here is quadratic. Okay, yes. So we have this linear system here. But there is a problem. There is a severe problem here. If you look at this linear system, what is the problem? Um, whenever we have to solve a linear system, what do we typically know and what is unknown? So if our linear system is like A, matrix A times vector X is equal to some right hand side B. And suppose this A is an invertible square matrix. So what is known and what is unknown? Hmm? A is known. Okay. And B is known too. And X is unknown. Okay. So we have to know these two guys. Do we know them? What is known and what is unknown? Why don't we start with the easy parts? I mean, here you, you see the, the system, the linear system. And these are the ingredients. Unknown is why. Yeah, that's good. So, we, we, of course, we want to determine this vector y. And what is known? A. A. I mean, that's simple. That's such a simple matrix. Uh, it's no problem to, to write it down. A is known. Okay, so here, this is known and this is unknown. But what about the right hand side? H is known. H is known, yes. What about R? R is known too. It's the boundary conditions. Now, what about this vector f of y? It is unknown. That's our problem. Look, these are the values in this vector f. And for these values, you need to know the yn values. But they are unknown. So we cheated ourselves. This is an unsolvable system. It's like a fixed point. Oh yeah, thank you. Oh, that's perfect. And that's what we will do. We will do fixed point iteration. We, we start with some initial uh, values for our y, uh, for the y values on our interval. We just use some maybe random initial values and then we iterate the whole thing. We do fixed point iteration. Okay. Yeah, so what we do is we, we calculate our yk plus 1 and use our y values from the step before. And now, of course, we have to talk about what are our initial values for the y's. We could use something random 
but we can do better. And what we do is, look, suppose these are our boundary values, these two, and suppose the solution would be this. And of course we don't know the solution, but the simplest thing we can do is we use a linear interpolation between the two boundary points. And that's what we have here. So um, why I zero, the ith point is alpha, which is the left border, plus beta minus alpha, the difference between these two. Um, no, sorry, it's beta minus alpha is this difference. This is beta minus alpha times i divided by m. Uh, and i divided by m is the relative point where we are in this interval. So this gives us a straight line between these two points. That's what we use as initial, as the initial solution. Uh, um, and now, in order to do fixed point iteration, we just have to multiply this equation by a inverse. And now we get, we get a fixed point iteration. We determine our next yk plus 1 by this formula. Now if we use as a shorthand for this right hand side, uh, capital F, then we have the well-known fixed-point iteration equation. Huh? So this is the fixed-point iteration and this is, so we are looking for, we want to determine a fixed point, which is the solution of our original equation. And this capital F is this. So that's what we have here on the right-hand side. Okay, yeah, please give me one more minute and then we are finished with this fixed point iteration. Y you all remember all about fixed point iteration. What do we need in order for a fixed point iteration to converge? Contraction. A contraction, thank you very much. What is a contraction? What is a contraction? What must be contracting here? I mean, this is our fixed point iteration, that's the fixed point equation. Uh, there is not much to find, it's, it's actually this function f. This function f must be a contraction. So we, and contraction means we need a Lipschitz condition for this function f. And that's what uh, we have here. Look, we need such a Lipschitz condition for the function f. So the norm of f of x minus f of y for arbitrary vectors x and y must be less than or equal to some Lipschitz constant L where L has to be smaller than 1 times the norm of x minus y. If this holds, then the iteration converges to the unique solution of equation. 30 of the original equation. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. And now we can solve such uh, second order boundary value problems also. But this, this method only holds for second order boundary value problems because, I mean, as you can see, we used an approximation for the second derivative here on the left hand side. Yeah. Of course, we can also develop um, methods for solving third order boundary value problems. What would be the change in the end of our, we would get a linear system too, we would do fixed point iteration. What would be the difference if we had a third order system? The difference would be we would need an approximation for the third derivative on the left hand side. And this approximation would not involve three values, but it would involve four values. So then we would get on the left hand side 
not a tridiagonal matrix, but a, uh, what is it in English? Quadro diagonal with four diagonals. Huh? And the higher the derivatives become, the more diagonals we have in the matrix on the left hand side. Okay, so now thank you very much for today.